Unit Four, Page Thirty One. Read, Exercise One. Read and listen to the text. An ecologist's dream. Some predictions about climate change suggest that global warming will make the central regions of the planet uninhabitable. This has prompted one country to accept the challenge of building a sustainable city in the desert of the Arabian Peninsula. To find out more about this ambitious plan, our reporter Tom Davis spoke to project engineer Ahmed Musa. The Arabian Peninsula is one of the planet's harshest environments. Why here? Well, the Arabian Peninsula is home to the United Arab Emirates, a country whose citizens have the biggest carbon footprint in the world. A carbon footprint is a measure of the amount of carbon dioxide that is produced by our daily use of energy, and people in the UAE have even bigger carbon footprints than the North Americans. The country is an economic success story, but the residents realize they can't continue consuming natural resources at the same rate. So, what is the UAE going to do to improve this? The government of the UAE's largest emirate, Abu Dhabi, has started work on a green city. The city will only use energy supplied by solar panels and other renewable energy sources, and it won't produce either carbon dioxide or rubbish. It sounds like an ecologist's dream. What's the name of the city? Mazda. A good choice, as it is the Arabic word for source. But is the desert the right place to build a city like this? Yes, I think so. Naturally, the Mazda planners have taken into account the location of their project. The city is going to be walled to keep out the hot desert wind, and the narrow streets will be shaded to keep them cool. And how will the city provide its residents with the water they need? Water will come from a solar energy-powered desalination plant, and wastewater will be recycled and reused for crop irrigation. Mazda will need 60% less water than a conventional city of the same size. Of course, cars are a big cause of pollution. How will the residents of Mazda get around? Well, cars will have no place in Mazda, and citizens will be encouraged to move around on the personal rapid transit system. So, when will the city welcome its first inhabitants? Construction will have finished by 2014, when it is hoped that 50,000 inhabitants will be living and working there. And how will the inhabitants earn a living? Most companies in the city are going to specialize in environmentally friendly products. Furthermore, research into alternative energy, sustainability, and the environment is going to take place at the Mazda Institute of Science and Technology. This university is already accepting enrollments from future students. Now, some people who are sceptical about the project have suggested that Mazda will make little difference to Abu Dhabi's high carbon footprint. What do you say to that? Mazda will not solve all the problems, but it's a step in the right direction. Supporters of the project see it as an opportunity for Abu Dhabi to become the global capital of sustainable living, and to offer a positive alternative for all cities of the future, not just for Mazda. Thank you, Ahmed Musa. Good luck with the project. Unit four, page thirty-four. Listen, exercises one and two. Listen to a radio debate. In tonight's debate, we have university professor David Wright and well-known scientist Millie Evans in the studio. Two old friends of the program who are going to discuss some of the predictions that experts have been making about the consequences of climate change. Now. You'll both have heard how the famous ecologist James Lovelock recently said that the reclamation and recycling of waste uses more energy than normal waste disposal. What do you think about those comments? Of course, I don't agree. How can Lovelock say he's an ecologist? He believes in nuclear power. He also says we'll all have to go and live in the Arctic soon because of the desertification of the rest of the planet. He says it'll be uninhabitable because of the heat. Well, he might be right about that. Unfortunately, I don't know who to agree with. We seem to have entered into a period where the newspapers are full of the opinions of a small group of scientists. People forget that forty years ago, all these experts said that there would be no space on the planet today because of overpopulation. They also said there would be more oil. Oh, come on, David! Just because some experts made two incorrect predictions. 
doesn't mean that all scientists' forecasts about the future are wrong. I'm not sure. A psychologist called Philip Tetlock studied over 80,000 predictions during 20 years by specialists in economics, science and politics. And guess what he discovered? What? That the average expert is no better at predicting the future than the man in the street. Oh, I'm afraid I can't believe that. Well, Millie, perhaps you should read the book he's just published about it. Mm. And one of the most important writers on the subject, Nassim Taleb, has invented a phrase to describe this modern habit of making predictions. He calls it... The scandal of prediction. It would seem, David, that you and your experts think we should do nothing about pollution and contamination. Are you being serious? We are not saying that, Millie. I believe very much in conservation and trying, for example, to avoid things like deforestation. But we should also trust our own instincts and not listen to experts who just want to create a climate of fear. The world isn't about to end. A climate of fear. The perfect title for our conversation. <laughs> well, now we're just going to let our listeners give their opinions. Unit 4, page 37. Language skills. Exercise 1. Listen and check. I've just had some surprising news. We're moving away next month. What? Why is that? My father is going to teach at a university in Brasilia. Brazil? I'll be really sorry to see you go. So will I. I had a premonition something like this was going to happen, though. Well, your dad had been talking about that project on sustainable communities in the Amazon, hadn't he? Yes. I don't suppose I needed to be an expert to guess it was going to happen. Not really. Isn't Brasilia a very modern city, built by a famous city planner? Yes, it was supposed never to get congested by traffic, but now it has the same traffic jams that all cities have. But I'm sure it's nice. I'd love to see it. Well, why don't you visit me? You'll have finished your exam soon. Good idea. Let's talk to our parents. Everyday English 4. Teacher's Book. Page 108. Giving a Presentation. Exercise 1. Read and listen to the presentation. How can one individual make a difference to the environment? In my view, one of the best ways is to use a Hessian bag for shopping. Hessian bags have a number of advantages. Firstly, they are long-lasting and do not break as easily as traditional plastic carriers. Secondly, they look more stylish. Furthermore, Hessian bags are biodegradable. This means that if you do have to throw one away, it will disappear naturally instead of adding to the waste in our landfill sites, which are already overflowing. On top of this, Many shops are obliged to charge for plastic bags nowadays, so carrying a Hessian bag can actually save you money. Finally, they are more comfortable to carry than a normal plastic bag. To sum up, making the change from a plastic carrier to a recyclable Hessian bag is an easy way for us to reduce the amount of waste we produce and, in doing so, to help protect the environment. Everyday English 4. Teacher's Book. Page 108. Giving a Presentation. Exercises 4 and 5. Listen to two presentations. Presentation 1. What is the best way for one individual to help the environment? In my opinion, public transport can make a big difference. Firstly, a bus needs a lot less petrol than the cars of all the passengers, so petrol consumption is reduced when people take the bus. As you know, petrol is a non-renewable energy source, and it may run out in the very near future. Secondly, traffic jams can be extremely stressful, whereas you can read or study on a journey by bus or train. Besides, the fewer cars that are on the road 
the less pollution there is in the city centre. On top of this, public transport is more economical than going by car, because you do not have to pay for parking on reaching your destination. Finally, the journey by public transport can be much quicker. In conclusion, I believe that by using public transport, we help the environment by using fewer resources and producing less pollution. Presentation 2 What can one individual do to make the world a better place? I believe that we should all become vegetarian. Firstly, the animals we eat are killed in a merciless and inhumane way. Furthermore, they spend their lives in cages where they can hardly move and never see the light of day. One way of stopping this suffering is by not eating meat. Secondly, developing countries where people are actually starving to death export grain to developed countries to feed animals. If we ate the plants we grow instead of feeding them to animals, the food shortage would virtually disappear overnight. Finally, in some countries, large areas of rainforest have been destroyed to graze cattle to make beef burgers. Roughly 1,000 species become extinct every year because of this destruction. Moreover, the burning of these forests produces dangerous greenhouse gases. All in all, I think a vegetarian lifestyle is much healthier for an individual and also much kinder to our planet. Literature Corner 2, page 108, exercise 2, read and listen. The Lipstick by Mary Roberts Reinhardt I was nearly home when I realized I was being followed. Feeling frightened, I stopped and turned. But it was only a girl. She spoke my name. Miss Baring, I saw you at the inquest, and a newspaper man told me your name. You've been to the Hammonds, haven't you? Yes. What about it? She was quite young and seemed nervous. Were you a friend of Mrs. Hammond's? She asked. She was my cousin. Why? She took a cigarette from her bag and lit it. Because I think she was pushed out of that window. I work in an office across the street, and I was looking out. I didn't know who she was, of course. Do you mean you saw it happen? I said, amazed. No, but I saw her at the window just before it happened, and she was using a lipstick. When I looked out again, she was on the pavement. Her hand started to shake, and she threw away the cigarette. I don't think a woman would use a lipstick just before she was going to do a thing like that. Do you? No, I said. You're sure it was Mrs. Hammond? Yes. She had on a green dress, and I noticed her hair. I went back tonight to see if the lipstick was on the pavement. I couldn't find it. The street was crowded. Someone may have picked it up. It's three days ago. But I'm sure she had it when she fell. That was what I had not told Fred, that Eleanor's gold lipstick was missing from her bag. I looked at my watch. It was only eleven o'clock. We could go and look again, I said. She would not tell me her name. Just call me Smith. I don't want to get involved. I have a job to keep. I found the lipstick. It was at the side of the road, and twenty cars must have run over it. But after I wiped the mud off it, the familiar letter E was there to see. Miss Smith saw it and gasped. <gasps> so I was right. Then she jumped on a bus, and I never saw her again.
Skills Roundup, 3 to 4, page 108. Listen. Exercises 1 and 2. Listen and match the people and things with the places. Now that's what I call a cool building. Where's that? Well, it hasn't been built yet, but it's going to be built in Eastern Europe. It's really original. It's so modern, but I think it really fits in well with all those old buildings around it. What are they going to use it for? It'll contain shops, restaurants and offices. The square was used as a car park before, so it'll definitely be an improvement. It certainly will. Who designed it? Zahar Hadid. Who? You don't know who Zahar Hadid is? She's one of the reasons why I want to study architecture at university. I like looking at good architecture, but I don't know the names of any architects. What's so special about her? For a start, in 2004, she was the first woman to win the most important award in architecture in the world. She's also got her own design firm, with over 250 employees in London. Really? So she's British then? Well, she was born in Baghdad, but she's worked all over the world. She's also taught architecture at some famous universities in the USA. Very impressive. I can see why she interests you. Well, it's her designs that really interest me. They're never conventional, but the buildings she creates are practical. She's not one of these architects that designs buildings that look good, but are uninhabitable. So, which famous buildings has she done? There are lots, but the most recent are the swimming centre for the London Olympic Games and a museum in the capital of Italy, Rome. But some people say her best building is a science museum that opened in Germany in 2005. Look, here are some pictures I've downloaded. They're really modern, aren't they? Yes, but she says she's inspired by the world's first architects of 6,000 years ago, the Sumerians. Sumer? That's... that was in southern Iraq. That's right. They were the world's first city planners, and when Hadid was a child, she used to visit the area with her father. She says the history of the place inspired her. I'm sure the Sumerians would be very surprised to know that they have had an effect on modern architecture. Well, that just shows how good they were, doesn't it?